All right, everybody, good evening. Hello, 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 hello. We are ready to go, ready to begin. Glad you guys are all here. Uh, hope that you're well and those that you know are well, doing well. So let's pray. Father, above all else, we love you and we want to obey you. We do not always and maybe sometimes even seldom know what we're doing. Uh, but we're here and we're willing and we want to grow and we want to learn and we want to be able to be light on the earth. We want to represent your light in, uh, in us. And we ask tonight that you be our guide in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to begin another reading from Exodus tonight. And we're going to begin with a little Hebrew study. There are five more words. Okay. And um, I want you to. Remember, when you're learning Hebrew words, you may learn a word, and in English, there are words that mean what they mean. Okay, one word, one meaning. Not all of them. Sometimes you have English words that mean a lot of different meanings, all right? In Hebrew, you have one meaning, and then you have shades of meaning behind it, okay? So what you're learning is... Uh, the basics, okay? The basics, the basic meaning. All right, that first word, if you want to do the little game where you cover up all the English, you have a sheen and a mem. That ought to be an easy word. There's only two letters. Shm, 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 okay? Shm. And it means name. All right? Shem, name. The book of Exodus in Hebrew is the book of names. Shemot. The book of names. Got a couple more Zoom folks to admit here. Okay, the next word is shalach. Okay? Shalach. And it means to who send. When Isaiah went into the temple and beheld uh, Yehovah and the train of his robe was before him and the words of God were, who will I shalak? Okay, who will I send? And Isaiah Hineni, here am I. It's me. Okay? The next word is a mem and a vav and a tav. The vav in there, since it's in the middle of the word, is a vowel. Okay? And that word is pronounced moot. Moot. Okay? And it means die. Like, really die. Like, you're gone. Moot, okay? The next word is an aleph and a kaf and a lamed, okay? And remember, if there's an aleph at the beginning of the word, you're not always, but you're off and safe beginning it with an ah. So that word is akal, to eat, to eat, ak. Oh, and then the last is an I, a bait, and a dalit, and it's pronounced ebed, okay, slave or servant. All right, you got all those? So now if I go back and I ask one of the ones that we've learned, you guys are all going to know it, right? Not one of you is nodding your head. Okay, one of you is nodding your head. All right. Now, we're really going to jump in and enjoy reading these lines in Hebrew. 
Now, you're going to recognize this. You may not recognize it right at the beginning because we're going to work through it slowly without the vowels. Just what, what are you reading as you read this, okay? From right to left. You have a yod and a bait and a resh and a kaf and another kaf. That letter on the end of that word, see where I mean? That looks like uh, this and then it goes down. Okay, that letter off when it's at the end of a word looks that way. The letter right by it that looks like a C, right, is the same letter. It just looks different at the end. So it's like it's a double letter. Okay, if I were to sound that out, it would be something like this. Okay, there's a yod, a bait, resh, kaf, kaf. Okay, moving on. Do you know the next word? Yod he vav he. Yahovah, right? Yod he vav he. Put those together, and you've got something like this. Okay. Next word. Vav, yod, shin, mem, resh, kaf. So line number one, all together, would be something like this. Have you ever heard anything like that? Okay, let me uh, say it a different way. Yehovah Next line. Yaer Yehovah Panaiv Eleka Vikuneka Yisa Yehovah Panaiv Eleka Vias M. Leka Shalom. So that is the ironic blessing written in Hebrew without the vowels. Yeah, except I can't understand your words. It's all right. Okay, now, you'll notice, you that have been here on Shabbat night, that I normally give you the ironic blessing in a way that would be similar to how you have it in a Jewish, uh, by a Jewish rabbi. So there's a word in there that you may notice is different in what we read right here and in what you hear on Friday night. Okay? Usually on Friday night, what you hear is, Adonai. What you just heard now is Because if you were with a rabbi, you would not hear Yehovah. You would hear Adonai. Okay? Because Yehovah is the, the name that is not pronounced because it's sacred. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that I don't believe that it's sacred. I do believe that it's sacred. But I believe that we were given the name in order that we might use it to represent it and to represent him. Okay? All right. Well, if you didn't get one of these, okay, or have one in your notes, we are going to go over tonight the dress of the high priest. Because that's in your reading, which is known as 
command. Tetzeva. And the reason it has that uh, name, Tetzave, is that is the the word in Hebrew in the beginning of Exodus 27, where we read in English, also, or in a lot of versions, and you are to command B'nai Yisrael. Now, when you read a word in the beginning of a sentence in English like that, okay, in Hebrew, it begins with the letter Vav. The letter Vav doesn't always need to be translated directly and. Because then what you get is you get what we have in a lot of our English versions. And, 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 also, and, and. Okay, and in Hebrew, it doesn't really feel like that. Am I right, Alan? It doesn't have that and, and, and breaking it up. Right. Changes the verb. I know you guys can't hear. That's okay. They can't hear you, but that's all right. I didn't know your answer was going to be that long. Ah. Okay. All right. So in English, you are to command B'nai Israel that they are to bring to you pure olive oil beaten for the light. It's something that they do to the olives that makes the oil. Beat the olives, make the oil. In order to cause a lamp to burn continually in the tent of meeting out the curtain, which is before the testimony. Aaron and his sons will set it in order to burn from evening to morning before Adonai. It will be a statute forever throughout their generations on behalf of Benai Israel. So the word burn, I think you learned last week in your words. It's Allah, and it means go up. Like go up in smoke, like us end. So when we get to Leviticus, you're going to learn about the offering that is known as the olah, which is from the word Allah, which means the offering that is burnt up. It literally means the offering that goes up. In your English Bible, you'll read a burnt offering. But I really like the word and the idea of going up because that's what is really behind the word. Okay? So you are to burn this, and as you burn it, the light emanates, but the smoke or the, the fume, the whatever, goes up. There's a going up is the idea. Now, the word continually that we read in English is amid, which doesn't, it, do, it doesn't need to mean continually. It might mean regularly. Like you're supposed to do it morning to, I mean, evening to morning, right? Okay, that doesn't mean that the light is there and the light is going 24 hours a day, seven days a week, forever. Okay, now we know that that wouldn't happen. One reason we know that is why. What happened when the glory, uh, the cloud, moved? What did they have to do with all of this equipment? They had to break it down, pack it up, move it on. That lamp was not burning while they were moving. Okay? So, anyway, the idea is that they were to worship God, worship Yehovah every day. That's the idea. Every day, this is going to be going, this fire is going to be going there, and they are to be worshiping every day. It goes up, the idea of your worship. Your worship goes up. And worship, by the way, in Hebrew, 
there are, there are, there's more than one word that means worship. Okay, the I I from what I remember, the word that means worship that is used the most or has the most weight is the word ahva, ahva, which means serve. So it doesn't only mean raise your hands and make music. That's an element of ahva, but it's only an element. Okay, there's a lot more to worship than making music. And yet, we still talk about the worship service, which is the music service. If we were going to be literal, it would be the music service. Your life is the worship service. Okay? All right. Even today, synagogues around the world have a light that burns regularly, known as the eternal lamp. There is a uh, famous commentary known as Etz Haim. Etz Haim. Anybody know what that means? Yet? Etz Haim. You learned the word Etz, I think, already. The Etz Haim was in the garden. The Etz, etz means tree. Okay, Chaim means life, literally lives, tree of lives. Okay, um, anyway, in this commentary, they point out that this is on, the only commanded practice given to Israel regarding the tabernacle that they're doing today, is burning that lamp in the synagogues. That's interesting. Now, to us, it means a lot more than burning a lamp, right? Because Yeshua gave us the message, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. So let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So the idea of that light that's in the tabernacle is that the giver of light emanates, if you will, his light. Okay? We receive that light. Now, remember, the lamp is not in the Holy of Holies. The lamp is in the Holy. There's the Holy place, then there's the most Holy place place or the holy of holies the lamp is in the holy place where there was a lamp and there was a table with bread on it right so the idea is in that area the bread is the word of god that you eat and it brings you light and the light of god and all of it is there in that room is there anything else in that room How's that? Ah, uh, the incense, which we know by reading Revelation, represents the prayers of us rising up to God. So in that holy place, you have the idea of eating the word of God, getting light from God, um, praying to God, and then when you go out, you give light to the world. Like Moses' face, that glowed. Remember that? Okay? So, anyway. All right. Next, in uh, 28, going into 28, we read, Bring your brother Aaron near with his sons from among Benai Israel, so that they may minister to me as Kohanim, Aaron and his sons Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Itamar. Okay, Kohanim means priests. Okay, now, sometimes when we learn, you know, we learn basics, but we don't get down into the, into the depth of it 
and we missed something. So here is something that a lot of us missed, okay? And we're not going to miss it now. The tribe of Levi, which in Hebrew is really pronounced Levi, okay? The tribe of Levi were set apart as the priestly tribe of God. However, that does not mean that all Levites were priests. Okay? While all members of the tribe of Levi were involved in the tabernacle in one way or another, um, some of them were the ones who were the, uh, uh, how do we used to call this, set up. They, they set it up and they take it down. OK, some of them, that was their job. All right. Others were those who cleaned up certain areas. OK, and on and on. All right. Only certain Levites were the ones who were the actual Kohanim who did the duty in the tabernacle that had to do with burning and uh, going into the Holy of Holies and the and the Holy Place and all that. Okay, the high priest was only supposed to be from the line of Aaron. Okay, and then when Aaron died, it had to be one of Aaron's descendants. Okay, the other Levites did other things that were needed around the the tabernacle. All right, so. Do you got that? Does it make sense? Okay. The Now, the roles of leadership in Israel. Now, in Moses' day, all the way to you get to uh, David, really, Saul, you could think of. But the leaders were to be the prophets and the priests. They were like the leaders in Israel. Okay, now, what did a priest? Prophet do. What does that mean? Prophesied. What does that mean? What? Tells the word of God to the people. Okay? He gives you God's word. He gives you God's answer. Sometimes the word was, look, this is what is going to happen. This is what is about to happen. Sometimes the word was, you need to not do that. Okay? Sometimes the word was, you guys need to go fight that enemy right now. Okay? Now, we already know a little bit about the priest's role in being like mediator, if you will. Okay? Later on in Israel, you're going to have prophet, which is, by the way, is represented by Moses. Because Moses is the one that went up the mountain, got the word, brought the word down, spoke the word, went back up the mountain, got the word again, spoke the word. That's what's going on there is Moses is giving us a picture of what the prophet is. Okay. Um, now, there's another leader that is going to rise up in Israel known as the king. And you will have prophet and priest and king. But right now, there's only one king in Israel. And it is not a human being. By right now, I mean in Moses' day. The design all along was that Yehovah is king. Now, that leads me to say something that is not in your notes, okay? That in the Greek view of God and what he is like, God has a, a map or a chart in his brain of everything that he's going to do and everything that's going to happen. So ultimately, everything is God's will. If it happens, it's God's will. That's the Greek idea, which, by the way, is based on a pagan idea. 
I mean, there's a there's a God. There's a God of Rome named, and we get that word. And in English, uh, if people don't believe in God, they will use this other word. Okay, anybody know what the word is? F A T E E, fate. Okay, so if it isn't God's doing, it's fate, which means that everything that happens happens exactly like God wants it to happen, exactly how it is designed. Now, when you get in and dig in and read the Tanakh. It's obvious that that is not right. Okay? An example, one example, is going to be when Israel, later on, at the end of the book of Judges, begins to cry out, we want a king. We want to be just like the other nations. And Yehovah says, no, you don't. Okay, and they argue, yes, we do. No, it isn't a good idea. You're not going to want one. Yes, we are. We want a king. So God gives them one. Yeah, who did they get? Saul. All right, and you guys may know how that went along. And by the way, his name means you asked. Yeah. All right. Back into what we're looking at here. Okay. I believe that this day, Yehovah's desire is that Israel, that's you, by the way, is that Israel functions as prophet and priest for the whole world. You bring God's word to the whole world. Right? You, in a way, mediate with others in order to bring them to God. Okay, that's prophet and priest. Okay, pointing everybody to the king of kings. Now, I know we've already read this uh, out of Peter's letter, but I wanted to bring it up again because he wrote, and by the way, he was quoting Aura, as he wrote this, but you are a chosen people, a royal what? Priesthood. Okay, he wasn't only writing to the lineage of Aaron when he wrote that letter. And we can read that letter as being written to us. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may do what? Proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Okay, moving on in Exodus 28.2, you are to make holy garments for your brother Aaron for splendor and beauty. Does anybody use the word garment? in your normal day-to-day -day speech? No? Okay. So what is a garment? Clothes. Okay. You are to make holy clothes. My dad used to look at me when I was little, and he'd look at me and go, <gasps> and he'd point. And I'd be like, what? He goes, you have garments all over you. I was like, what? Mom, what's a garment? And she'd yell at my dad, you know, burn. Yeah, he did things like that a lot. I loved him. All right. Now, holy garments or holy clothes means set apart coverings. Something that you're only going to use for one reason. My uh, friend Robert has coveralls. You know what those are? Okay, and they zip up, and I think it's got a little thing here that says Ed, even though his name is Robert. 
and he only uses those when he's going to work on vehicles or when he's going to paint. So I was like, oh, those are your holy garments because they're only used for that reason. So you're to make them, and, the, and what you're to make them for is splendor and beauty. Splendor is abode, which has a lot of different meanings. The, the root meaning is weight. We translate it as glory. So you've heard of the glory of God. The glory of God is the weight of God. Weight like heavy weight, which I always thought was very interesting, and I never really got it. I don't even know if I get it now. All right, but the idea is th th things that are weighty, things that are heavy are very important. Okay, and there's a weight of the glory of God. Think of it when uh, maybe you remember later on this happens when Solomon builds the temple, which in a way is like taking the tabernacle and going, all right, now we're going to make it better. Even though God never said, I want you to now make me a structure. No, he didn't do that. That was something that David wanted done, but David wasn't allowed to do it because he had blood on his hands, and Solomon was the one who got to do it. So he did it, and he built it, and he got everybody together, and they had a grand worship ceremony. During it, he asked Yehovah, he was like, look, I know that you don't live in houses made with hands. We know that. We're not dumb, okay? Although Solomon proved later that he was rather dumb. He was the wisest man that ever lived for a very little while. And then, and then he lost it. Okay, anyway. So he asks Jehovah, bless this uh, temple that I've built or we built, and we built it for you. And they begin to worship, and they begin to uh, proclaim the words, um, bless the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. He is good. He is good. And the glory, okay, Abad of Yehovah entered where they were and everybody went down on the ground. Pfft. Why? Because it was heavy. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. The weight of glory. <clears throat> All right. Let me go on. The other word, beauty, means beauty and adorned and honor. Okay? So you're going to make these, and they're going to be gorgeous. These clothes are going to be gorgeous, and they're going to have weight. They're going to be glorious. Okay? The high priest now, by the way, I got this uh, idea from Mark Biltz, is uh, somewhat like a repair man going into repair. Air the world. Every article of clothing had meaning that was related to atoning for uh, sins. Okay? And so we're going to look at some of those. There were eight articles of clothing. And you might remember the number eight means new creation through what the the priests will do the idea is Israel is going to be made into a new creation okay so here are the garments and you can take your garment clothing page look and follow along if you want and if you need one i have three more left anybody need one or want one you can give that one over to Dana and anybody else. Take tick them all and your charge out now. All right. We're going to begin with underwear. Yes, that is mentioned in the Bible. White linen undergarments. And the idea is there is an at 
atoning for sexual transgression. Which would make sense. It's the one that's nearest your body. Okay? White linen undergarments. Very interesting. Many of the pagan religions of the day had their priests do what they did naked. Okay? And God's priests were not going to be naked. Okay? They were going to be clothed. Now, the reason that these other religions did what they did naked is a lot of what they did in the worship of their gods was uh, sexual acts. Okay, there were even prostitutes who were there at the entrance of the pagan temples. And in order to get in, you had to meet with one of them. Okay? So, you know, what... Yehovah is doing here is he's not only setting up something that's going going to be representative of what he's ultimately going to do in Yeshua, but it's something as well that gets Israel away from the religion of Egypt and all of the nations that are around them. Okay, white linen undergarments. The white linen tunic or robe, like some people say that it is, okay, in order to atone for acts of murder. And when I was looking this up, I did not find the reason why that was, that was there. So I'm just giving you this information from Mark Belt. Okay? According to Josephus, the tunic was rather... Height in fitting and went from the neck all the way down to the feet. And only a small part of it was visible around the ankles. Okay? So this is what's, you know, you got the underwear on, and now you're going to have a white robe-like thing on, but it's not heavy, heavy. Okay? Because you're going to have other things that go over that. Okay? Next is the blue robe that atoned for evil speech. Okay, the robe had to be seamless, and it had an opening for the head and a couple openings for the arms, and around the hem of the robe were blue and purple and red pomegranates, which alternated with little bells made out of gold. The blue robe went from the neck to below the knee. Now, you know what that means if you're wearing all this and you're moving around. Tingle, 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 tingle. There's, there's noise that's being made. It reminds me of uh, going on a hike in the woods in Alaska. Ding, 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 ding. We went on a winter hike recently, and someone that we went with had the bell. Ding, 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 ding. We were like, uh, why do you have that now? The bears are asleep. Well, maybe they're not. Maybe one, one is awake. Okay, well, he'll know we're here. Ding, 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 ding. Okay, next is the ephod atoning for idolatry. This two-piece garment okay covered the chest and the back on your drawing it's this multicolored almost looks like a vest okay that goes down all right sometimes the ephod is confused with the breastplate but the ephod is going to be what the breastplate at Hatches too. The breastplate is not as long as the ephod. The ephod goes down below the waist. Okay? It's embroidered with blue and purple and red linen yarns. The front and the back were separate and held together by a strap over the shoulders. And there were 
two onyx stones connected to each of the straps with each stone engraved with the names of six of the tribes of Israel. So you had six on the left, six on the right, riding right here on your shoulders. Okay? Now, there's going to be the names of Israel are going to be here as well, near the heart. But they were on the ephod near the shoulders. Okay? And uh, you read in Exodus 28, 12, fast the stones upon the shoulder pieces of the ephod to be memorial stones for Benai Israel. So Aaron is to bear their names before Adonai on his shoulders as a reminder. Memorial, zakar, remember and be mindful. So the ephod is symbolic of a shepherd. Yeshua is our high priest and our shepherd in the heavens. He has the names of the children of Israel on his shoulders as he bears their sins and burdens. Do you know uh, how a shepherd carries their lamb? Around their shoulders, on their shoulders. So in Luke, we read in the words of Yeshua, he says, which man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, will not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he has found it, he puts it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And you read that and you're like, yes, the lost. He's going after the lost. Remember, Yeshua is going after the lost, but he's really going after the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So this is not only about him just going after anybody who's lost. This is very specific about him going after those who are of Israel who are lost, and he's going to put them back where they belong on his shoulders. Neat. Okay, now, the breastplate. This is the thing that's, like, right here, like uh, armor almost, okay? Uh, it was known as the breastplate of judgment and atoned for wrong judgments. At least that's the symbolic picture that is given. It was square, and it had a little pouch in it known as the Hoshen. And there were 12 precious stones that were placed in the little squares on the breastplate. And each one was engraved with the name of one of the tribes of Israel. So Israel is on the shoulders and Israel is near where? The heart. Okay, this is gorgeous. Now, in that little ocean or pouch, there were two uh, unique stones known as the Urim and Thummim. Is there anybody that's never heard of those? The Urim and the Thummim. That's very hard to say that. Urim and Thummim. We're going to get to those in a minute. So keep that in your mind, and we'll go back and get to what the Urim and Thummim were all about. Okay, so the breastplate, also known as the breastplate of judgment. Okay, if you will remember one of the words that we learned, mishpat. Mishpat doesn't mean judgment as much as it means justice. Justice. So the breastplate of justice, the breastplate of just decision, which is exactly how Yehovah deals with his people. He's not. Sometimes people hear the word judgment is, is a bad word, 
right? It isn't a bad word in Torah. It's a good word. Okay, it's it's God's justice is good. It isn't bad. It's good. It's righteous. It's wonderful. You and I ought to be glad that that uh, we have a just God. Okay. Now there's a white linen turban, which is like a white cloth wrapped around the head, which symbolizes a t- Owning for arrogant for an arrogant look, meaning Jay, I am gonna look arrogant because I am better than you are. All right. As we read in Psalm, the wicked one with his nose in the air never seeks him. Nose in the air. That's the idea of arrogant. Okay? Now, there was a crown or a plate that wrapped around the turban that had writing on it, and the writing on it was holiness to Yehovah, or kudosh le Yehovah. So you got the diagram there. So imagine you have this all all of this gear on and you're going to walk tinkle 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 as you walk you're making noise the little bells down there are making noise and you have this thing on your head and the words are holy to Yehovah and you have the tribes of Israel on your shoulders and on your heart It really was an amazing thing. Last, there's a white linen belt atoning for wrong thoughts from a sinful heart. The reason that wrong thoughts is your thoughts were related to your kidneys, okay, which is where the belt goes. Sometimes you read about that in uh, King James Version. Now, there's, believe it or not, there's truth in that. Okay, we have learned as of recent that your gut is connected to your brain. Did you know that? So all of that area is interconnected and even even to your brain. Okay, now the belt, which is like a sash, Maybe you've read it in your versions as a girdle. When I read that in my King James Bible growing up, uh, you know, I knew what a girdle was, and I was like, really? Those guys wore girdles? That's not that girdle, okay? It's a belt, all right? Now, let's go back to this Urim and Thummim that were within the breastplate of judgment, okay? God says they are that Moses is to put the Urim and the Thummim within the breastplate of judgment so they will be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before Adonai. Aaron will bear the judgment of Benai Israel on his heart before Adonai continually. Now, we do not know exactly how the Urim and Thummim were used. Okay? It looks like they were used in a way like dice. Like you ask God, God, what do we do in this situation? And you roll the dice. Okay? But you only have two options on the dice. Yes or no. Okay? Left or right. So... The idea is not that there are a whole lot of different options. The idea is you're gonna you're gonna put the urim and thummim out there, and you're gonna get the answer. But there's a deep meaning to this. Okay, the word urim is from the word or. Do you remember the word or? It's in Genesis one. Okay, uh, let there be or light. 
okay? And remember, that light is not the light in the room here. That light is the light of enlightenment. It's the, the light of God in, in, on the earth, okay? Let there be or. Urim are lights, because it's plural. It ends in an im. Thumim means, is from the word tam, okay? T-A-M, which Moses was one of. Not Moses, Noah. Noah was righteous. He was upright. He was a tam. Jacob was a tam. It means upright and righteous, okay? A, or whole, or complete, but it's plural. So what you have then is the urim and the thumim are plural nouns. Sometimes you hear them in English as the lights and the perfections, okay? Which is exactly what Yehovah is, right? In our life, okay? Something else about this, the first letter, and you can look there because I have them, or and tam, umim and thumim in Hebrew, the first letter is an aleph, okay, of the first word of lights. The first letter of the second word is a tav. So they begin with aleph and tav, the beginning and the end. Remember, Yeshua in Revelation, I am the Aleph and the Tav. I am the beginning and the end. And that uh, word is a mark that is throughout the scriptures that remind us that he is the beginning and the end. Okay. Now, there's only, there's a, just a handful of places in the Tanakh where the Urim and the Thummim are mentioned as being used. It's very interesting, okay? And it seems like whenever you read that they were going to make a decision and they were going to use the ephod, it means they were going to pull out the Urim and Thummim and use them, okay? One example of this is in first. Samuel 23, verse 9, with David. Okay? And so let's read this. Now, David knew that Saul was plotting evil against him. So he said to Abiathar the Cohen, bring me, bring the ephod. Then David said, Adonai, God of Israel, your servant has heard for certain that Shaul intends to come to Kiela to destroy the town because of me. Will the men of Kiela surrender me into his hand? Will Shaul come down as your servant has heard? Adonai, God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. He will come down, Adonai's head. Okay? In other words, now I know in our world, hearing this, it sounds almost like one of those little balls with the eight ball. You remember that? Did you ever see one of those or have one of those where you shake it and you were like, does, does Judy love me? And you'd look at it and say something like, go home. Okay, whatever. I don't, I don't remember. It almost looks like that. But I want, you to, I want you to remember, okay, as we're reading this, you're reading something 3,000 or more years old, and you're reading about a group of people that are being led out of paganism. Okay? Um, so. So remember that. One of the things that I read in Dennis Prager's work was this. According to the Italian 
Jewish scholar. I didn't know there were any Italian Jewish scholars, but there are. Umberto Casuto. The Urim and the Thummim were the Torah's response to the magic and divination practices in all parts of the ancient world. So even the Urim and the Thummim were thereby limited in their ability to discover God's will. Only the leader could do it, and only on behalf of the whole nation. That ended all individual divination. Exactly. No more crystal ball, no more eight ball, no more you going down to the local deity or the local god and asking, what do I do about this? What do I do about that? How is that going to happen? No, that doesn't happen anymore. And I like what uh, Bradford wrote about this. The breastplate could be characterized quite correctly as being the breastplate of the gospel as it incorporates the concepts of God's justice, God's light and perfection, and Israel as the nation through whom God would justify the whole of mankind. Of course, it turns out that the nation of Israel would produce a very special Israelite, Jesus of Nazareth, who was the cornerstone of of God's justice. So there's a lot more going on, on these, in these clothes than meets the eye than when you're just reading. All right, I want you to make this and I want you to make that. Um, I believe that someone who has great uh, and a lot longer than we're able, able to do right here, great work on the uh, clothing is Rude, Michael Rude. If you go to a rude awakening online and type in uh, clothing of the priests, he wears them and then tells you all about them. He's got a lot of great information on them. Okay. All right. Moving on. Exodus 29. And now we're going we're gonna to look at what they're going to need to do in order, in order to ceremonially consecrate the Kohanim. Now, this is what you are to do to consecrate them. <coughs> Excuse me. So that they may minister as Kohanim. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish, along with matzot, cakes of matzot, mixed with oil, and matzot wafers spread with oil, make them from fine wheat and flour. So when you read this, you're reading about an event that happened once. Okay, that this event that you're reading back right here was not supposed to happen over and over and over again. This was a once event in order to inaugurate the priests so that they might begin doing the work of the Tabernacle, okay? Most of 29 is about this ceremony, this event. Now, remember how important it is that Israel is removed out of the mind of Egypt, okay? And worshiping the Egyptian gods. One young bull and two rams you may remember back during the Exodus when we looked at the plagues that bulls and rams were worshipped as gods in Egypt. So, I want you guys to take the gods of Egypt and burn them up. That's what happens to the gods of Egypt. Okay? Uh, more than that, all right, with not all, but with a lot of the offerings that are going to be given in the book of Leviticus, they get to eat the bulls and the lambs. So it's like not only are you, you're going to barbecue the gods of Egypt and eat them every day. Okay? And then 
uh, along with matzot, which is unleavened bread, which, by the way, the whole leavening process was invented in Egypt. So you're going to eat unleavened bread, not only because you had to hurry up and get out of Egypt, but in this ceremony, I want you to be reminded that there is not anything of Egypt that's going to remain in your mind. That's the desire. Okay? But like I've heard and said a lot, it was a lot easier for God to get Israel out of Egypt than it was to get Egypt out of Israel. Okay. Now, you are to bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Did you know that this can be connected to what Yeshua did when he washed the feet of his disciples with water? Okay, he washed them with water. And he humbled himself as Moses would have done in order to wash the feet of these Kohanim. Okay? And that, when Yeshua washed their feet, he wasn't only saying, you guys need to do what I do, and you need to be low, you need to be a servant. He was. But he was inaugurating them in their priestly duty. Because he was the high priest of the new order of Melchizedek, right? So he has now anointed his priesthood, if you will, which is why Peter writes in the same uh, sentence almost, is what we read er earlier, when you are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Well, look at what else he writes. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Messiah Yeshua. In other words, you guys are all priests. Tinkle, 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 tinkle. Holy to Yehovah. Okay. Now, something else. He uh, said when you're getting these animals ready, all right, take all of the fat that covers the innards, the lobe above the liver, the two kidneys, along with the fat that is on them, and burn them on the altar. Well, in the divination practices of Egypt and the Near East, guess what they used for divination? They would slaughter the animal, they would remove the liver and the innards, and they would use it in order to divine what it was that the gods wanted from them. Isn't that something? And I didn't know this, but there's an example of this very thing in Ezekiel. Okay? In Ezekiel 21, you read this. The king of Babylon stands at the fork in the road, at the start of two roads, in order to seek divination. He shakes the arrows, he consults the idols, and he looks in the liver. Because that's something that the pagans did. You know, it's amazing, really, when you, you start to dig into this and see all that God does in order to remove his people out of paganism. And then you read history and you read the development of the Roman church that added it all back in again. And we've been dealing with that ever since. You know, we're like Israel. All right. Um, so you then you are to offer the whole ram up in smoke on the altar. It is a burnt offering. 
talking to Adonai, a sweet aroma, an, aro- an, aro- an offering made by fire to Adonai. The priest will show as he burns the offering that the gods of Egypt go up in smoke. Okay, then he says, slaughter the ram, take its blood, and dab it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tip of the right ears of his sons, on the thumb of their right hands, and on the big toes of their feet, and then pour the blood on the altar all around. Now, you're going to be anointed with this blood from your head to your toe, is the idea, but there's more. Okay, So the blood of the ram, like the blood of the lamb, is the idea of substitution. Okay? In other words, the ram is a substitute so that you don't have to die. The ram is going to die. And it's going to give its blood on your behalf so that you don't have to give your blood. But this blood is going to be, if you will, on your doorpost, meaning it's going to be on your ear. What does the ear have to do with your life with God? Yeah, Shema. Shema Yisrael. Hear and obey. And it's going to be on your thumb, on your hand, which has to do with all of the work that you do. And it's going to be on your big toe, which has to do with everywhere you go. So isn't that neat? Okay. <clears throat> So the animal whose blood the high priest sprinkles on the mercy seat bears the substitute death that is required of our sins. For this reason, Hebrews speaks, as I've already mentioned, of Yeshua as our high priest. He represents us. He carries the burden of our sins before the Father. He is the substitute for all believers, and he is the substitute death. It was his blood that was shed and through which atonement was made. This means that Yeshua is both the high priest and the sacrificial animal. And he's the prophet. And he's the king. So all of these ideas that we're reading about in the Tanakh, they, their goal is Yeshua, which is why Paul writes in Romans, the Messiah is the goal of the Torah. Okay? Meaning all of these things that we're reading about. Now, in their day, when they were doing them, the rituals that they were doing, even though they were uh, pointing ahead, they had meaning in their day. So someone asked, well, did these um, animals that they brought, when they brought these animals, uh, did God forgive them then? Did it bring them forgiveness? And the answer is yes. It did. It absolutely did. So what did it not bring them? That Yeshua brought. Well, there's a lot, but in regard to the the sacrifice, the animals. Okay? Eternal life. No, it brought forgiveness. What was that? Yeah. Salvation from what? In, okay. What about what it does in here in your conscience? Because in Hebrews, you read that the blood of bulls and rams were never able to clean your conscience. Yeshua is able to do that, okay? And the one of the ways that he does that, do, does that, that he does that, is he gives you the Ruach. He gives you the Holy Spirit within. Okay? 
So not only are you going to be clean on the outside or ceremonially, but you're going to be clean in here on the inside, which is awesome, right? And there's one other thing that he brought. He died once. So you don't have to do this over and over and over and over and over and over again every day. Okay, now we offer up the offerings or the sacrifices of what? Praise. Okay, in Hebrews, you read this about the uh, foreshadowing of uh, all of this that we've just read about with the sacrifices and the priesthood. Therefore, <clears throat> it was necessary for the replicas of these heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Messiah did not enter into the holies made with hands, counterparts of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in God's presence on our behalf. Okay? And Paul writes in Colossians, Therefore, do not let anyone pass judgment on you in matters of food or drink or in respect to a festival or new moon or Shabbat. These are a foreshadowing of things to come, but the reality is Messiah. Now, I want to say something about that verse. Okay. In the NAS, the New American Standard, and I believe in the King James Version, there's a word in there that is added that isn't in the Greek. Okay, it's a letter, Colossians, written in Greek. The word is mere. These are mere shadows. The word mere is not in there. Okay, so why would the word mere be in there? Because they wanted to knock these ideas down a notch with the idea that it didn't matter anymore because you're not under Torah anymore, so you don't have to do any of these things anymore. So this is one of the verses that is used a lot in people who are debating over, well, I don't need to keep Torah because right here, I can read it right here. Do not let anyone pass judgment on you in matters of food or drink. You can eat what you want. Ooh, time out. Go back and ask, who wrote this letter? Ah, who, Paul, who was a rabbi, who never did anything against Torah. Okay? He said that in the book of Acts. At the end of the book of Acts, Paul said to uh, Felix, I have never done anything against Torah. Okay, so that's number one. And then he writes this letter. Second thing is he's writing the letter to the Colossians, which is in a region that is made up very much of a very heavy, non-Jewish, Gentile population. In other words, what I'm getting at is the way that we have traditionally read this verse might be the exact opposite of the meaning of it. For example, if I were looking at you and you were a pagan coming out of paganism, okay, and you begin to do what the Messianic movement people were doing, what were they doing? They were meeting on Shabbat. What were they doing? They were eating what's on the list. What were they doing? They were keeping the festivals, the Moedim, the appointments that are in the Bible. They were watching for the new moon. Okay, They were doing all of these, and all of those, by the way, are a shadow of what is to come. Not just what was, but what is. Okay? So I write to you and I say, look, don't let anybody judge you 
because you're eating by the Bible laws, because you're meeting on Shabbat, because you're keeping a new moon, because you're, you get it? Okay? Because the very next verse in Colossians, he begins to deal with the pagan things that they are doing, like uh, uh, cutting themselves and things like that in order to get near to the gods. Okay? So anyway, I just thought I would bring that up. Fun, right? Okay. Uh, we have, oh, my goodness, I just went on and on and on and on, didn't I? Questions. Wait until I get the mic over to you, okay? Your hand was up first. Go ahead. I don't know if you remember 20, um, um, no, not 19, not 19, 2019, September 2019, there was uh, um, the tabernacle thing that was presenting yeah. on thing. This is the exact thing that they were showing here. Oh, really? And I remember when, um, just two people I know, I, I saw from here, okay. went out there and they were showing just everything, the same thing that is in here. That's really neat. Yeah, there is, I don't remember the name of the group. They go around, uh, at least the nation, I don't know if they go around the world, and they set up a tabernacle that's modeled, just like that one. So, are they? Seventh-day Adventists. Yeah. Neat. Okay. Tom's. First Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen people. And that was said to Hebrews, but the Christian church says it, we are it. But you said it's also a quotation from the Torah or the Tanakh. Do you know what verse? Well, it's in Deuteronomy. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Somebody that has a Bible that has little references in them, or I can look it up in a minute and let you know. Um, it's more than one verse. But, well, it's in Exodus 19 when he's bringing them out of Egypt. And he says, if you keep my covenant, then you will be to me a, those words that you read there. So it's in Exodus 19. I think it's like verse 6, maybe. I don't know the, the exact first number. But you brought up something very interesting. If you read the introduction of Peter's letter, who does he address his letter to? Does anybody know? Huh? No? Peter? Oh, well, let's look. I have a Bible. The first Peter is addressed to... Okay. The... This is in the Tree of Life version. That he's writing to the... Sojourners of the diaspora. So that means he's writing to Messianic Jews. So yeah, he's going to remind them of that verse. But remember, within Messianic Judaism, within the Messianic Jewish movement, there are Gentiles. So he's not only writing to Jews, but he's addressing it to the ones who are out there. In the diaspora. Okay, another, I saw another hand some, somewhere. Hold on, we can't hear you. I mean, we can hear you, but they can't hear you. No, um, in, in, um, in Leviticus, where it's, it's talking about the different um, foods you should eat, meats and whatnot, these people were worshiping those animals. And then in the New Testament now, when Paul came, uh, remember Peter with the sheet and all the rest of it, all this has a lot to do with that. But a question I want to ask you, what, what, what area in the Bible when, um, is it a Paul, Saul, had gone to the witch of Endor? And... Yeah. The, you mean, where is it in the Bible? It would be in Samuel. Yeah. Samuel. Yep. Dana? Oh, I have 
Several, several, yes, several, several questions. But the first question I have is the question about Peter's dream and the food. Okay, so you have a dream, and uh, this is in Acts 10. And you, I want you to read the book that I'm writing right now because I have a whole section in there about that. Okay, Peter is hungry, and he has a dream. Now, I've had dreams when I'm hungry about things like spaghetti or a good moose or something like that. He's up on the roof, and he's having a dream, and God is about to lead him over to the home of a Gentile. And up to now, Peter, who's a Jew, okay, doesn't even know if it's all right to sit down with Gentiles, let alone go over to their house and eat with them. Okay, so he has this vision, and in this vision, all of these animals that are not on the right list of things that you should eat, but just animals like nasty animals like snakes and shrimp and, oh, sorry, uh, just things like that. And he hears a voice, and the voice says, Peter, get up, kill him, and eat him. And he says, never, never, I have never done that, and I'm not about to now. And then he hears it again. The dream comes again, and then the dream comes again, and then he wakes up, and he's like, I have no idea what that was about. Knock on the door. Here's a bunch of guys, and they're from about 40 miles away, and they want Peter to go to the guy's house who's a ruling uh, Roman soldier because he wants to hear about Jesus. And Peter's like, all right. He brings his guys who are all Jews, and they go over to this house, and they sit down, and here's this, this non-Jew, Gentile, and he's, uh, he wants to know more about God, and he wants to know more about Jesus, and Peter suddenly goes, ah, oh, I get it now. This is what the dream was about, that I'm not supposed to look at you, Cornelius, and call you unclean. Because God doesn't call you unclean, which, by the way, he didn't. The rule that you weren't allowed to go hang out with Gentiles is not in Torah. That's in that religious uh, rabbinical oral law. So what I'm getting at is that dream had nothing to do with food. It had to do with human beings. People don't, you know, they're not unclean. Okay. James. Well, I don't know how much of the Pandora's box I'm trying to open. I don't know if we have enough time, but you just discussed a bunch about the temple and all these great things and the coming and the change of the Messiah and the, the fulfillment of, uh, I'm going to say the word sacrifices, but you reference Ezekiel. What in the world do we expect with this new temple and its discussions about uh, sacrifices for sin? And things that take place in the future temple that are after the Messiah has already came once as the atonement for our sins. All right. With that, we'll end tonight. Thank you, James. There's always one. It's not always you either. There's always one. All right. So here's what James asked. He's asking about reading Ezekiel. Ezekiel's about one of the things that Ezekiel is about is the millennial temple, okay? That isn't the only thing that Ezekiel is about. Remember, the prophets gave messages about things that were imminent in their day, okay? Then there's a greater fulfillment later, and there might even be more than one. So it happens here. And then it happens here, and then it happens there. And when it happens there, meaning in the millennium, it's bigger and more amazing than anything anybody can imagine. Okay? Now, regarding um, things being offered, things were offered in the book of Acts by the believers, by the Messianic believers. They were offered, right? So why wouldn't they be able to do that again? if they wanted to do that. Well, only as uh, symbolic. It would only be symbolic. Yeah.
because Yeshua did that once and for all. So the only things that would be offered would be things that are symbolic in nature, right? I mean, most people on earth right now don't have animals and don't live around animals and aren't at all, um, uh, there's like no relationship in their world with what we're reading about in this world because they don't live in a world of animals, cows and sheep and things like that. Probably be better off if we did, but we don't. So, Okay, we're going to end. Half of the Zoom audience has left because they probably can't hear us well enough. And uh, But I'll stick around for another couple minutes if you guys want to. Uh, hear anything else. So I'm going to say goodbye to you guys on Zoom. God bless. Hope you have a great week. Uh, if you're able to tune in Friday night, we're on uh, YouTube and maybe that Facebook thing that I don't use. But you're welcome to use it if that's what you want to do. So uh, say goodnight to you guys. And